really three things. Um, a couple of obvious things. People love anything that's salty and greasy. Potato chips, onions, french fries. That salty, greasy combination grabs us. And if you look at cheese, you don't think of it as being as stony, salty, or greasy. But the fat content, the grease content, 70% of calories. And there is more sodium, salt, in cheese than there is in potato chips. Exactly. Um, huge amount. It's, it's added in the cheese making process as a way to flavor it up, but also to keep the fermentation process from going too far. They add the sodium to it, and that knocks out the bacteria so they don't over ferment. So that's the first part. But the big part, and Chuck, you were kind of hinting at this earlier, is there something in cheese? Is there some compound in cheese? Yes, there is. And the word is casomorphic. Uh, casein derived morphine like compounds. Casein is the dairy protein. You'll, you'll see it on the food label, C-A-S-E-I-N, casein. It's the dairy protein. When it comes out of the cow, the, the, the proteins are long strands of amino acids. And in the calf's digestive tract, it breaks apart and it releases these casomorphin molecules that are, in fact, in the chemical class of narcotic opiates. By that, I mean they go to the calf's brain and they attach to the very same receptor that any opiate or narcotic would attach. Uh, and scientists speculate that this is part of the, maybe called the mother into bond, um, or kind of a calming uh, effect on a nervous breastfeeding baby. Uh, it's in human milk too. And mother nature never imagined that an adult would keep drinking milk or make it into cheese and the reason that cheese is more addicting than yogurt or milk is because the casomorphins are concentrated. As you turn milk yeah. into cheese, there it, cheese becomes sort of dairy crack, if I can put it that way. Um, it's it's not as strong as say heroin, but it's about um, the, uh, the the strongest casomorphins have about one tenth the brain receptor binding power compared to pharmacy grade morphine. So not enough to get you arrested, but more than enough to keep you hooked. And that is why people say, well, I could be vegan, except for the cheese. Or um, is there a little time in my refrigerator? <laughs> they don't know the word casomorphin, but that's what their body is craving. It's, it's silly. And, and even though you're talking about just 10%, I mean, that's still a lot when you're talking about the power that those opiates have that have that full 100%. And just 10% of that is plenty enough to get your hook stuck in there. And it's, I mean, the chat has already lit up with people talking about this. It's, it's really a phenomenon. Uh, Colleen at 1204 saying the cheese trap is the book that got me off of cheese once and for all. She says that she is forever grateful and would recommend that book to anybody who is struggling with cheese addiction. And that group of people who are still struggling includes Shannon, who has today's first question. She's like, okay, so now we know that cheese is addictive. What advice do you have, Dr. Barnard, for breaking cheese addiction? Oh, well, what a great question. And you know, this is something that we see in every research study we do. We have people with diabetes or weight problems or menopause or something. When they begin a plant-based diet and cheese isn't part of it, I mean, neither is chicken and fish and these things, they don't really miss the meat. They don't miss the chicken or the fish. They don't miss the eggs. Um, but they do say, gee, you know, I really love to have some cheese, and it does show the addictive part of it. So we do a couple things. Number one, and this sounds a little harsh, but, but let me suggest it anyway. Don't cheat. The reason I say this is every smoker learns that it is harder to cut down than it is to quit. If you dangle in front of yourself something that you have been addicted to, you never forget it. It's reawakening those old memories. And anybody who has dealt with addiction, which I think is, frankly, 100% of humanity when you look at all the foods that you can get on, um, you just realize it's, it's easier to let yourself kind of forget it. So, so if, if cheese is an issue for you, set it aside. Don't have it at all, period, zero. That sounds harsh. So the way to make it workable is focus on the short term. Just take, say, three weeks. OK, breathe. The next three weeks, I'm not going to have any cheese. All right, I think I can do that. At the end of that time, the taste buds have started to adjust. But if you had cheese, even once a week, it comes back. Second one, um, think of substitutes. And here, nutritional yeast is your big friend. If you never had it, go to the store, uh, health food stores, 
they sell nutritional yeast. And you, you got to push aside the bodybuilders who, who are getting nutritional yeast for its protein content. But you get it because it, it's, it is cheese, basically. Um, it's, it's not cheese, but it tastes just like it. Put it on your pizza. Um, put it in um, a stew or something like that. It's right. used in mac and cheese recipes without real cheese. Yeah. So nutritional yeast is good. There are vegan cheeses out there. Have them if you want. Skip the coconut oil-based ones. Choose the nut-based ones. They're healthier for you. Uh, but even those, as time goes on, you'll find you. So give it a shot. See what you can do. And you'll discover that you end up being turned off by cheese. Yeah, you'll, just, you'll discover you don't want it anymore. And, and, and let's kind of delve a little bit deeper into that. You just mentioned some of those alternatives. Pamela is wondering whether those dairy-free alternatives can be less addictive because there aren't going to be the casomorphines in there. But yeah. if you flip it over, you look at the nutrition labels, there's still an awful lot of fat and sodium in there. There is. No, it's a better kind, it's a better kind of fat. It's less saturated fat, typically. Um, if you choose, a, a choose, say, a cashew cheese, it's, it's uh, less of the saturated fat that's in um, it's in the dairy cheeses. If you choose a coconut-based, coconut oil-based coconut based, uh, cheese, it's, I mean, it's vegan, but it's really high in saturated fat, so I, I would not choose it. It's totally off the truth. The other piece of this, though, that once people learn where cheese comes from and they realize that all dairy products involve artificially inseminating moms, taking her calf away at birth so that we can have the milk instead of the calf, killing all the males for veal, um, killing even the dairy cows themselves after about four or five years because their production doesn't continue as high, people just get turned off about dairy. Um, it, it, it becomes something you just sort of don't want for ethical reasons anymore. And, and I think that that's, you know, I'm a doctor obviously, and so we speak about health, but I found that so, for so many people, when they look what, what's, what it takes to get one of these foods to your plate, uh, like cheese or foie gras or something, you're thinking, you know, maybe, <laughs> Maybe I can skip that one and a uh, little bit better place. Here's an interesting question from Rosa at 1206. She says, ice cream got the best of me last summer after being vegan for four years. She's wondering whether those KHO morphines exist in other dairy foods aside from cheese. They do. Um, they're not as concentrated. Uh, cheese is the dairy crack, as I say. It's got the most, and that's because it goes with the protein. So uh, cheese has more than ice cream. But with ice cream, what are they doing? What, what are they doing? They are making it not so much a savory as a sweet. So yes, there is casomorphin. In this case, it's not salty, it's sugary. So now they're hitting your sugar addiction and your casomorphin addiction at the same time as ice cream. Right. A little bit ago, you were talking about saturated fat and Mag is wondering about just that. She's wondering whether saturated fat is the only fat that can raise cholesterol in your diet. Uh, it's, it's really the only one that matters. Uh, fats are always mixtures. So chicken fat has, oh, maybe 30% of the chicken fat is saturated. And then the other 70% is a big mixture of various kinds of unsaturated fat. And the one that the, your question is, is the saturated fat the bad actor? The answer is yes. Um, and that's why people like olive oil, because it's only 14% uh, saturated fat. Or it's why somebody like me says, how about no oil at all? And then you knock that number down to zero. All right, olive oil. Man, see, now that just triggers another question. I want to dive into a leftover from last week's show. Uh, Cindy watched, and she's like, I'm still confused about olive oil. She wants to know whether the type of olive oil, in this case, extra virgin olive oil, makes it a healthier option compared to other olive oils. Only very slightly. Um, the champion for extra virgin olive oil um, we'll talk about the fact that it, is, it hasn't been refined to the extent that the other olive oil uh, products have been. And so what they're bragging about here isn't so much differences in the fat content, but the fact that there are other biological, really phytonutrients that are there. And so the assumption is that those are healthier for you than, than beef fat, than bacon fat, than fish fat. That's all true. Um, the reason that we're cautious about that too is that all fats have nine calories in every single gram. So that's why when people go Mediterranean, it's a little bit, it's better for your heart than a, an unmodified diet, but not even remotely as good as a vegan diet. And it doesn't cause weight loss at all. Mediterranean diets are just, 
they, they're just a complete failure when it comes to lowering uh, body weight and really they don't lower cholesterol much either. And that's because the this oil content is there, it's just packing in the calories and it's, it's still got more saturated fat than you need. Uh, take a question from uh, Liana at 1210. She's wondering why her doctor told her not to stop eating dairy. So when it comes to doctors being taught about nutrition in medical school, obviously we know that there are a lot of shortcomings. So I guess this is kind of a, a two-parter for her. Is like Number one, where do things stand as far as what the curriculum currently says about dairy? And number two, what can we do to get this information that we're talking about today in front of more doctors? Well, it's a great question. Um, because nutrition is not yet a major part of the curriculum of any U.S. medical school. Um, it's, uh, a, it's basically non-existent in many and just a very minor thing in most. Um, your average doctor doesn't even get one lecture about dairy's hazards, um, despite the fact that these are very well known, the contribution to prostate cancer, for example, is, uh, I mean, the, the evidence for it is, is very, very strong, and yet doctors don't counsel men to anticipate their cancer risk by avoiding dairy. Um, so doctors don't get much nutrition education about dairy. But how many commercial, dairy-funded commercials have the average doctor been exposed to throughout their life and throughout their professional career? A huge number, um, including even CME, Continuing Medical Education Event, sponsored by the dairy industry. That's something we have been fighting and including this past year. The dairy industry is out there trying to convince doctors that dairy is a great source of calcium and as opposed to all the frankly healthier calcium sources out there. So I, I just I, I really think that we've just got to continue to improve uh, medical education. So your question is how? Um, I think waiting for medical schools to change, um, I mean the next ice age is going to arrive before that happens. Um, I think what we have to do, and hope I don't sound too optimistic, but, um, I think what we have to do instead is create materials and make them enjoyable for doctors and something that works for doctors like nutrition-oriented continuing medical education. We offer that at, at PCRM. Um, and Sarai Stancic, who you know, Dr. Stancic has been a good guest on this show, um, and is our director of medical education. We have this huge amount of CME that doctors take at our annual conference that you've attended and have interviewed the, the, the speakers on, uh, the International Conference on Nutrition and Education. Doctors go. It counts as medical education. They get totally pumped up, and they're learning what they didn't learn in medical school. So I, I think over the short run, having this kind of continuing education is what's going to really be a game changer for them. Not just for doctors, but frankly, dietitians need some good information too. They're focusing on nutrition, but sometimes it's not exactly the best <laughs> nutrition. Same for nurses, same for other health. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, our own conference, the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, back live and in person this summer, coming up in August, right here in Washington, D.C. If you're interested in attending, um, pcrm.org slash ICNM is the web address to go ahead and register for that. Couldn't it be easier? pcrm.org slash ICNM. We hope to see you there. I'll be doing some live interviews throughout the conference, so it will be great if you could stop by and say hi. And, I mean, you want to talk about raising your health IQ. You're talking about three days that are going to send it into the stratosphere. It's amazing how much information gets crammed into just a 72-hour period. I get so pumped up for this conference. I think you. Oops, 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 sorry. There we um, go. One, right. of, one of us froze, and I, I don't know which one it was. Sorry about that. Um, but you were talking about ICNM. Let me just mention I think it is going to be fabulous, our best one ever. Um, it's getting kicked off by Jamie, Congressman Jamie Raskin, um, who has been just all over the news ever since he was elected. But he himself has followed a healthy diet in part um, because he's had health issues in his own life that he's talked about, but in part because he's got a conscience. And, and um, he's going to lead us off. He's going to welcome people. Rita Redberg from JAMA Internal Medicine will also welcome everybody. We've got sessions on COVID, uh, new sessions on diabetes management, and universal meals are going to be unveiled. So it's going to be the biggest, best ever. There it is, pcrm.org slash ICNM. We do hope to see you there this August. Uh, but Dr. Barnard, let's continue our cheese conversation. Or actually, let's, let's transition this now over into just a dairy alternative conversation. And take a question from Terry, who is wondering whether almond milk is as healthy as soy or oat milk. 
Um, yeah, almond milk is fine. It's different from soy in that it's much lower in protein. Soy's selling point is it's tasty, it, it's that good mouth feel, it has those isoflavones that are cancer preventers. Yes, soy, soy milk and soy products reduce breast cancer risk and prostate cancer risk. Almond milk, maybe not, but it's not cow's milk, so it's a heck of a lot healthier, uh, even though it's lower in protein. Jerry, speaking of soy milk, is soy milk good for someone who has rheumatoid arthritis? Um, fine. Um, however, I, I would have one caveat, and that's people with rheumatoid arthritis very often have a trigger, that they or more than one trigger for their symptoms. I'm saying um, potatoes might trigger it, or dairy might trigger the symptoms. And, and it's not common, but once in a blue moon, you'll see somebody where soy protein might have been their trigger. And it doesn't mean soy is unhealthy, it just means that if you're allergic to strawberries, you can't have strawberries. And in a rare case, so it could be one of them. How do you know? Um, the way to know is you eliminate all the common triggers, and then you bring them back in your diet one at a time and see which one is possible. Right. And by the way, speaking of the cheese trap, in the appendix of the cheese trap, I give the list of arthritis triggers there. So you just eliminate those foods and bring them back in one at a time and see where your symptoms get kicked off. Let's take a couple of questions about fat here. Uh, this one seems to get asked a lot, so I'm glad that we continue to put this information out there. A simple question from Lucha Brown at 1213. They're wondering how many grams of fat should you eat in a day? Um, the, I hope people don't worry too much about percentages and specific numbers. Um, I'll, I'll give you some, but let me first just suggest what I, I think is a good way to think about it. If you are eating the four healthy foods, it's grains, and beans and vegetables and fruits. And you're not adding fat because you found ways to cook without it. You steam and bake things and whatever. Um, if that's what you're eating and nuts and seeds are only a really small part of what you're consuming, then your fat content of your diet is not gonna be where it is in America now, which is maybe 30, 35% or something. Yours is gonna be probably under 10% of fat. That's great. Because that allows you to keep a healthy waistline, keep your cholesterol down, keep your hormones in much better balance, everything's going much better. Um, so 10% of your calories are going to be coming from fat. But I, but I hope you don't worry too much about that number, whether it's 10 or 9 or 11 or 12, or, you know, somewhere in that area it's going to be fine. I wanted to take a quick second to say hi to So Mindful, who is uh, sneaking us in at work right now. Uh, probably ducked down in her cubicle, headphones in, listening to the, the examiner live here on Facebook and YouTube. So thanks for being here. And also Judith tuning in today from Jamaica. That's awesome. Thank you both so very much for being here. Um, this is a popular holdover from last uh, show as well. It's a question from Pamela, and she is wondering what are some good options, Dr. Barnard, for non-stick, non-toxic cookware? Oh, great, great question. And this has been really controversial because back in the 70s, um, Teflon was becoming really popular. And um, at that time, the product, they really hadn't quite bonded it properly to the to the, the fry pans. And after a while, people would be scraping up little chunks of the Teflon into their foods. And, and you know, I, I think it kind of earned, earned a not very good reputation. However, times have changed. Um, and so the, the concern then became that um, as the Teflon was heated, and, and Teflon is non-stick, and it's pretty much inert in normal settings, but um, with initial heating, it will give off some toxic fumes. Um, but those are mostly burned off nowadays in the manufacturing process. If you compare a pan from the 70s and a pan from today, they're just completely different. So my own sense is that the current pans are fine, healthy, and dramatically better than cooking with oil. Um, but I got I got a couple of tips. One is um, well, a couple of brands. Um, Made in is a brand. If you uh, go on their website, you can buy a really good nonstick pan. And one of the things I like about Made In is that the layer under the Teflon is not aluminum. You want to avoid aluminum coming in touch with your food because aluminum is linked to neurological damage and Alzheimer's. The evidence is, is still being weighed by scientists. It's, it's, I think there's good reason to be controversial about it, but don't be any experimental group. Just avoid aluminum. So the Made In brand is one that, that has got attention because of the layer under the nonstick is steel. And there's aluminum as a sandwich down, you know, a couple of layers down, but it, the 
that's a good brand. Uh, Demeyer is another one that has had some very good tans, uh, but all of these uh, brands will change their what they're offering, and so they, they do drift from bit to bit. Um, let me mention um, when you get your pan home, a couple things. Um, clean it up really well, and you already know not to use metal implements on your nonstick pan because you're going to end up scraping it off. So you've got to use plastic utensils to do that. Don't thermo shock. Um, let it heat gradually, and never heat a nonstick pan to really just huge high temperatures. There you will degrade. So low and moderate temperatures are good. And then when you're done cooking, don't do what a lot of people do, which is throw it in the sink and turn on the cold water, because you're just shocking this this, uh, this nonstick surface that's trying to help you. Let it, let it cool down kind of gradually. Um, and when you um, go to clean it, don't use a Brillo pad. Be gentle. Use just a regular sponge. Dry it off, stack it up with a towel on top, and that is going to baby your cookware, and it's going to love you back. Man, I'm going to isolate that last three minutes, and anytime the question comes up about cookware on the show, I'm just going to play back what, <laughs> what you just said. That was the definitive answer, Dr. Barnard. That was fantastic. Um, follow-up question from Dylan, not just about what it was you just said, but also a follow-up from last week where the conversation about aluminum prepped up, and he's wondering whether the same thing can be said for aluminum foil that you were just mentioning with aluminum cookware. Yeah, the human body has no use for aluminum. You need iron, you need copper, there, there are some metals that your body uses as cofactors for enzymes and other things. Aluminum is not one of them. If you ingest aluminum in food, your body tries to get rid of it, and in industrial accidents, aluminum uh, exposures are clear-cut neurotoxins. So avoid it. Um, so you get some aluminum foil. If you wrap a sandwich in aluminum foil, no problem. But what if you've got, say, an aluminum container with uh, the spaghetti left over from an Italian restaurant and you've covered aluminum foil on top, and then the acids in the food are directly in touch with that aluminum and they start to dissolve and the aluminum is getting in your food. So, so don't do that. That's a, you want to use cardboard, you want to use even plastic or something like that, or use a, like a plastic reusable container, those are better choices for food storage. Edith at 1217 kicking us back to dairy. Edith is wondering, if you have issues digesting milk, will you also have identical reactions when you eat cheese and yogurt? Um, if There are two reasons why milk can be a digestive problem. Uh, one problem is milk allergy where the proteins in it are sending you into conniption. Not very, uh, not very common in adults, but it can happen. And if you're allergic to cow's milk, you're going to be allergic also to anything that's made from it, um, like yogurt or like cheese. The more common issue, though, is not an allergy, and it's not a reaction to the protein. It's lactose. It's reacting to lactose, where this is Mother Nature's way of saying you're not a baby anymore. And when you were a little newborn, you had enzymes in your digestive tract to break apart the lactose sugar that gives that faint sweetness to milk. Went down your digestive tract, the lactase enzymes break apart the lactose sugar, and you absorb the little tiny sugar that break out of it. Uh, after the age of weaning, the normal sequence for humans and all mammals is to lose those enzymes. They go away because you're not breastfeeding. Um, a mutation occurred in some mostly white populations um, some thousands of years ago that caused these enzymes to persist longer in life. So you might be a 40-year-old person and you're still ingesting milk like a baby. Uh, but among every other racial and ethnic group, um, the rule is really for those enzymes to dissipate. And so you drink a glass of milk and you get a bubbly stomach from it or, or worse, you feel terrible. Um, and that's that's not a disease; that's natural. Um, but with when you make when you turn milk into yogurt, the uh, cultures typically break the sugar apart, and when it's turned into cheese, the sugars are removed, so they are more digestible. That makes them all much worse because you're not getting nature's warning sign to not eat this stuff. Um, cheese is is. If it were any worse, it'd be Vaseline. I mean, it's a, it's a huge contributor to sodium. I'm, I'm serious. Sodium, cholesterol, saturated fat, and numero uno 
in, in those areas. So you don't want to go near it. Same with yogurt. Uh, great advertising, terrible food. Uh, you don't need it. Uh, dairy products have like so many health issues. Uh, the top of the list is cancer, but other things too. So steer clear of it. Lactose intolerance is not a disease. It is a warning sign that you are too old to be breastfeeding. So skip the dairy. You want to open some eyes here and just lay out the facts, just some cold, hard facts. I love this discussion. I love this question from Jesse at 1226. Jesse is wondering, why is the dairy industry subsidized by the government, and how can we change this? Yeah, uh, it's been going on for decades, and, and not just here in the U.S., but, but this has been happening in other countries, too, where uh, U.S. government uh, programs promote dairy, um, and have an organized uh, promotional programs of doing research to try to make dairy look good, doing specific promotional activities for it, and specific laws putting dairy in the schools. And I'm not going to make this up. There is a U.S. federal law that a kid, 16-year-old kid, uh, in the lunch line at school, bring his tray along, and the, the uh, food service person says, here's your, here's your carton of milk. And he says, I can't have that. I, I got lactose intolerance. It, you know, ever since I was eight years old, I can't, I can't drink healthy milk. The food service worker cannot, by law, give him an alternative. She can't say, oh, here's some almond milk instead. Here's some soy milk instead. Here's some she, by law, she cannot do that. Unless the student produces a note saying that he's got a disability. Wow. Or a medical condition. And it's obviously wrong, it's out, completely outdated science, and I'm going to say it's racist. Uh, because you're talking about kids, African-American kids, Asian kids, uh, Hispanic kids, who want something they can digest, but they're not allowed to have. Um, how do we change this? Um, we speak up. <laughs> we, we need to, let, obviously, let our representatives of Congress go. And you're not just um, shelling down the well. Because our lobbyists, the PCRM lobbyists, are pushing to get rid of these outdated laws right now. And to the extent that you can support that by getting rid of the Congress on board, please do. Uh, do sign up for our action alerts. We'll let you know how you can help. The dietary guidelines are revised every five years. We are central to that process. And so there's a role that everybody can play. We're, we're gradually winning. We're not winning fast enough, but we are winning. And we're going to work together. We'll get it. And guys, as a former reporter, both with NBC and CBS, credibility to me is everything. And when I first learned of this government connection with dairy, I was skeptical. And then I was pointed to just a trove of documents that were obtained by the Freedom of Information Act that were published by the New York Times. And it shows this huge, huge, huge conversations between all of these major restaurants, we're talking Domino's, Wendy's, Pizza Hut, you name the fast food restaurant, they are in bed with what is called Dairy Management Inc. And so you have this government connection that is really steering these major cheese campaigns that you That's see right. advertised throughout the year. You know, I think back to what was it, one of the big ones, Dr. Barnard, was the summer of cheese. I believe that that was a Wendy's oh, yeah. campaign. That, you know, there are government documents that talk about the success. We of have seen these, we, we, we've seen these campaigns with McDonald's, we've seen them with, we, we, we've seen these campaigns with McDonald's, we've seen them with Burger King, we've seen them with uh, Wendy's, we've seen them with just about all the major uh, fast food chains. And I could show you, shockingly, contracts between the U.S. government and the fast food chains specifically to promote cheese. Um, they do it, why do they do it? Because they have to. The U.S. federal law says the government has to promote American agricultural products and cheese is at their top of the list. All right, I, I promise you this, uh, as soon as the show is ended, I will tweet out a link from at Chuck Carroll WLC to that New York Times trove of documents that I was just referencing. It is mind-blowing. If you want to kill at least a few hours just looking through some of these documents, these contracts, uh, these campaigns that we were just talking about, I mean, just get ready to go down one crazy rabbit hole that is all 100% true. Uh, but we do have a couple of minutes left. I want to bounce around, still talk about a couple of other things, take a few other questions. Uh, importantly, one here from Liana on a different topic altogether, but she's on a health journey, so I really want to get to this one, Dr. Barnard. At 1225, she's wondering, how fast can someone come off of metformin once their blood sugar has stabilized? Oh, great question. Um, 
It, it's really between you and your doctor, but metformin is the most common drug used for type 2 diabetes. And for, in some cases, doctors stop it immediately. Um, the person is, they, are, they have type 2 diabetes, they just got done a vegan diet, their weight's coming down, their blood sugar's coming down. There are some doctors who stop it right away. And it's totally defensible. There are others who say, metformin is a pretty mild drug. It's not going to drive into hypoglycemia, so we just stick with it for a while and we keep people on it for a long period of time. Between you and your doctor, but um, many doctors uh, end it quite soon. Popular question here from Joanne at 1229. Are vegan foods such as uh, vegan burgers and vegan chicken that uh, are plant-based, are they as healthy as other options? Well, the vegan substitute for a burger or a vegan substitute for bacon or whatever is always better than the one other places. And when you're looking at the specific brands, um, pick the vegan option that is lowest in saturated fat. You'll see they vary quite a lot. The possible is pretty high, not as high as the meat one, but it's high. So you might find that there are better choices than that. So choose ones that are the lowest in saturated fat, they're, they're going to be better. And let's see here, Blue Jay Jitsu. This is a fascinating question. We were talking earlier in the show about cholesterol. I've never heard this question. Maybe you can clear up the confusion. Could a whole food plant-based diet cause cholesterol to go up initially when a person begins eating that way because of a breakdown of atherosclerotic plaque in the arteries? Uh, no, uh, your cholesterol can bounce away, and it could momentarily be higher, but it's not, not for that reason. Um, What's happening in your plaque is, is that, the, that the plaque, the little bumps in the artery wall, they shrink fairly gradually. It's not going to have an appreciable effect on your, on your cholesterol level. But what will happen, two things. Um, one is cholesterol just goes up and down based on the, the, the fiber content of your diet. If it's a little bit lower, you're not removing the cholesterol as well. If it's a little higher, you're going to rapidly. The other piece of this is if you happen to have, say, some peanut butter, and you happen to pick a brand that has palm oil in it. Well, palm oil's got saturated fat in it. Or let's say you have the vegan carrot cake that was made with coconut oil. It's not as bad as butter, but it's kind of close. So that'll raise your cholesterol level too. But if you avoid those two fats, the coconut oil, the palm oil, you're going to see that that bouncing cholesterol number is going to bounce down and down and down. And down. And uh, final question here today. Let's take one from an Instagram viewer. Wants to know, could a low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet reverse diabetic gastroparesis? I hope so. Uh, let me be a little bit um, coy on that. Uh, what we're talking about here is that you know that when you have diabetes, the high blood sugar affects not just your, your it, 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 it affects your whole body. It doesn't affect just your heart. It affects your eyes affects your kidneys, and it affects the nerves. And that's called neuropathy. And people experience this with numbness in their feet, sometimes unusual sensations, pain, uh, pins and needles, a stabbing sensation. But you have nerves in your gut as well, and you have nerves in your stomach. And those nerves can be affected too, and gastroparesis can affect your, your stomach just isn't empty.